Hi guys, I'm Satya. I work at Google on the Android platform security team, and uh, I've been working on adding an encryption support to the kernel. So, motivation: Why do we want to do inline encryption? Why do we want inline encryption support in the kernel? Well, actually, let's start at why do we want to do encryption at all? Because it turns out our users want their data to be secure and private. I hope that's not a surprise to anybody. We want to make sure that if you lose your phone or it's stolen, you know, someone else can't just go through all your bank passwords and your large secret collection of cat videos. So one way we protect our users' data on Android is by encrypting their data before storing it. And inline encryption, which I'll go into a lot more detail about, is a way of speeding up this encryption. Many vendors make inline encryption hardware, and each of them has had their own set of patches that support inline encryption but none of them have been upstream so far. So every year, these vendors, and also us at Google, because we ship phones with such an encryption hardware, have had to maintain and rebase these in encryption patches. So we really like to have an upstream solution that's designed a way to reduce the total overall burden on everyone. Ideally, with our upstream solution, in an encryption vendors will need to write and maintain at most a small part of the storage stack, of the storage driver rather than their uh, entire inline encryption patch sets, which touch most, of, most parts of the storage stack today. And another reason for a unified approach to inline encryption is the generic kernel image, or GKI, project that Android is pursuing. GKI essentially requires Android phones to boot up and be completely usable with just GKI, a generic system image built on top of GKI, and some under specific kernel modules. In particular, encryption and inline encryption hardware must also be supported by GKI. And since inline encryption requires changes to the base kernel and can't be done purely with some vendor-specific modules, uh, again, we need this uh, unified approach to inline encryption. All right, on to FDE, FBE, and FS script. Uh, that's a lot of acronyms. So on Android, we used to require support for full disk encryption, FBE, uh, a while back all data on the disk was encrypted with the same key. So users had to provide a key at boot time, and before this key was provided, the system couldn't do things like receive text, ring alarms, etc. So we wanted something that was a lot more flexible than this, something that would let us boot into user space and ring alarms, for example, even before a user has provided their password. And to that end, we wanted to be able to encrypt different parts of the file system with different keys. So this leads us to the current encryption solution we have on Linux and Android, which is file-based encryption, or FPE. The idea of FPE is to have per-file encryption keys, well, really an encryption context that contains all the information you need to encrypt or decrypt data, like the key, the crypto algorithm that you're using, the data unit number, and so on. The support for FPE was baked into X4 about four years ago, and sometime later, F2FS began to support it, and the common crypto code between X4 and F2FS was factored out into FS script. And file systems like X4, F2FS, and UBFS call into FS script to perform crypt operations whenever they need to. And they maintain information about the encryption context for each file. And this is how FPP with FS script works. So in the Linux storage stack, struct bios are basically the unit of tra data transfer. And they essentially read, they essentially describe a location memory to read from or write to a location on the block device to write to or read from, a size, and the type of operation, for example, a read or a write. So when file systems want to write an encrypted file, they construct one or many such struct bios and, and uh, encrypt the data in these bios by calling into FS script, the encryption context, and submit the bios to the block layer. The bio goes down the stack, and data will eventually be written by a storage driver to the storage hardware. When file systems want to read an encrypted file, they construct the same struct bios and submit them to the block there first. And when the read is completed and the bio comes back to the file system, the file system then calls into FS script with the encryption context to decrypt the data in those bios. In either case, note that the encryption context is only needed above this red line. Only FS script needs to know what the encryption context is for, a particular for the data in a particular bio. Now on to inline encryption. So on Android, we make use of FS script to support file-based encryption. And inline encryption hardware is a way to speed up encryption with FPE. 
All right, so with inline encryption hardware in the picture, uh, this is what the storage stack looks like. Uh, inline encryption hardware sits right before the storage hardware in red, and it can encrypt or decrypt data going through it. So inline encryption hardware have a small number of programmable key slots, and each key slot can be programmed to hold an encryption context on the fly. And any data request that flows through inline encryption hardware can be tagged with a key slot. And the inline encryption hardware will encrypt or decrypt that data with the encryption context that's currently programmed into that key slot. So this makes inline encryption hardware well suited to accelerate FBE and offload FBE related work from the CPU. Uh, note that inline encryption hardware is distinct from self-encrypting drives and Opal, which have existed for quite a while now. Uh, these technologies also encrypt and decrypt data as it flows from memory into the disk. So the data flow, the, the data flow diagram will look similar. But these technologies essentially have a single key for all the data in the disk. So all data going into the disk is encrypted with essentially the same key. Uh, this is a stark contrast to the capabilities that inline encryption hardware provides, where data in each individual struct bio can be encrypted with a different key. And whereas for self-encrypting drives, software simply provides a password that allows access to the disk encryption key, for inline encryption hardware, software provides the raw key itself that will be used for the data encryption. And so here's the context of the problem that we're addressing. Linux doesn't currently have support for inline encryption, and each of our vendors with inline encryption hardware has different patches to support their hardware. Uh, there have been a number of approaches our partners used, uh, and some of them tried to upstream their patches, but none of them were well received by upstream so far. Uh, we already have a script which gives us the ability to associate a file with an encryption context, which is something we can continue to use. But now most of the storage stack needs to be aware of inline encryption. For example, the request layer, which merges two BIOS that read or write from adjacent locations on disk, needs to now also ensure that, two BIOS, that the, the two BIOS that it's going to merge have the same encryption context. Further, the encryption context for a struct BIOS somehow needs to be communicated to the inline encryption hardware down and read in the stack so that it knows how to actually encrypt, what key to use to encrypt the bio. And as I mentioned, there have already been many past attempts to solve the problem. One main issue with some of the past attempts were layering violations. They also made uh, some non-generic assumptions, like assuming that the number of key slots present in the uh, present in the hardware was at least the size of the SCSI queue length for the UFS device. And this was true of the hardware the patch was, uh, address, was, the patch was targeting, but no such guarantee exists for other hardware. And it had some other hardware-specific code. Some other approaches involved representing inline encryption as a kernel crypto API algorithm. We think that the kernel crypto API algorithms are fundamentally different from inline encryption because the kernel crypto API does transformations from memory to memory, while Inline encryption does transformations from memory to disk, and specifically only to the disk that the hardware is hardwired to. All right, so moving on to high-level objectives. Uh, our main design objective is to make our approach useful to any inline encryption hardware, rather than just for some particular storage drivers or some particular inline encryption hardware. This means that we want it to be possible and hopefully also easy to add support for our approach to inline encryption to any storage driver. One of the considerations here is uh, we'll need to be able to handle the case where we have more encryption contexts in flight than we have key slots for in hardware. Uh, one issue is that programming a key slot with encryption contexts might be expensive on certain hardware. And further, BIOS are serviced by storage drivers asynchronously, so it's possible for file systems to submit, say, uh, 100 BIOS with 50 unique encryption contexts in total at pretty much the same time. And if our inline encryption hardware only supports 32 key slots, then we'll need a way to make 50 encryption, unique encryption contexts share those 32 key slots. Uh, while also making sure that any two BIOS with the same encryption context share the same key slot instead of duplicating the same encryption context across multiple key slots. Also, within, even within devices using the same storage driver, for example, UFS, inline encryption hardware from one vendor may work differently from those of another vendor. So we want to make it easy for vendors to extend support for their own particular hardware if such, such extensions are necessary, if their hardware has certain quirks, say. We also want to make it easy for any file system to uh, 
make use of an encryption hardware when it's available. Obviously, it would be bad to require users to use a particular file system if, uh, you know, if they want to use an encryption. And one more thing that we want to have is a fallback to the kernel crypto API in case inline encryption hardware isn't available on the system. All right, on to the changes that the patches introduce. So as I mentioned before, most of the storage stack now needs to be encryption aware and needs to know what, an, what the encryption context is for any given bio. So we'll add a field to struct bio, a struct bio crypt CTX that can represent an encryption context so that we can pass the encryption context down the stack along with the bio. We'll also introduce a key slot manager to solve all the issues of sharing key slots between encryption contexts. It'll ensure that each unique encryption context is programmed into only a single key slot, and it'll maintain ref counts for the key slots. It'll also evict unused key slots if there are no empty key slots to program a new encryption context into. And if all the key slots are busy, then it'll make the thread sleep until a key slot does become available. So we add a new field, a struct key slot manager to the request queue of each device. So the key slot manager will also act as the interface between the inline encryption hardware and the block layer. So for each bio, we'll program its encryption context into a key slot when it's submitted to the block layer. The block layer will call get key slot on a key slot manager and pass it an encryption context. The key slot manager will eventually return a key slot that has been programmed with the specified encryption context and increment a ref count for that key slot. Now, of course, the key slot manager also needs to somehow know how to program and evict key slots on the actual hardware it's associated with. So it's the storage driver's responsibility, responsibility to set up the key slot manager in its, in its request queue and pass it a bunch of function pointers that will allow the key slot manager to do things like program and evict encryption contexts. So to actually make the changes to the block layer and make it program encry encryption contexts into key slots, as well as to achieve a few more goals, we introduce block crypto, which, is, which logically sits between the block layer and the request layer. And given a bio, it will call the key slot manager in the request queue that the bio is destined for and gets a key slot for the bio's encryption context. So block crypto also contains a kernel crypto API fallback for when inline encryption is not available. We fall back to this whenever a request queue does not have a key slot manager set up or if we fail to program an encryption context into a key slot manager. This fallback lets us present a single unified way of doing data encryption to file systems so that file systems don't have to worry about whether the underlying drive the device uh, has inline encryption hardware or not and it can always rely on the block layer for data, encryp for data encryption. So block crypto can also handle devices, for example, when the target device for a bio is a DM device that maps over multiple devices, each of which it may have possibly varying inline encryption capabilities, as long as the DM device itself sets up a key slot manager in its request queue. So when the bio is first submitted from the file system, Block Crypto will program the encryption context into the DM device's key slot manager. And when the DM device gets the bio and passes it back to the block layer, block crypto will release that key slot in the DM's key slot manager and program that encryption context into the key slot manager of the underlying device. And uh, further cloning a bio with an encryption context will also clone the encryption context. And if the source bio has a key slot for its encryption context already, then the clone will also take its own ref count to the same key slot. So even if the DM device clones the bio instead of just resubmitting the original bio, uh, things will still work out fine. Now, because Block Crypto has a kernel crypto fallback, it can also handle strange cases like a DM device that maps over two devices, one of which has inline encryption hardware, while the other one does not. Now, there's still the issue that we will be allocating essentially a dummy key slot manager with some sufficiently large number of key slots, which will waste memory, but we will fix that problem too. So to fix that problem, we'll introduce the pass-through key slot manager which uh, does not actually manage any key slots. Uh, and so it doesn't use much memory. It also does not need any function pointers to manipulate inline encryption hardware, like a function to program keys into key slots, for example. It still needs a function pointer that allows the upper layers to query which algorithm the inline encryption hardware supports. 
So block crypto will simply do nothing if it sees that a request queues key slot manager is uh, actually a pass-through key slot manager. So it won't try to program a struct bio encryption key into any key slot anywhere. And it'll just let the struct bio go down the stack. It's up to whoever is processing that bio to handle the encryption key in the bio if it's present. So in the case of a device mapper, a DM device can set up a pass-through key slot manager instead of a regular one with a large enough number of key slots which will save a lot of memory. The encryption context will simply go unmodified to the DM device and will be resubmitted to block crypto with that, and the bio will be resubmitted to block crypto with, that, with the same encryption context again. And this encryption context will eventually get programmed into real inline encryption hardware, as in this example, or uh, maybe even fall back to the kernel crypto API if ultimately necessary. Also, so far I've talked about inline encryption hardware that have a limited number of key slots and data requests are tagged with a key slot to perform encryption. But some inline encryption hardware actually allow data to be tagged with the key itself. So keys don't ever need to be programmed into key slots for such hardware. So the pass-through key slot manager is also useful for these types of inline encryption hardware uh, that don't only have a limited number of key slots and would benefit from being able to work directly with the keys. So because of what block crypto does for us, the interface that we can present to file systems becomes a lot simpler, as file systems don't need to worry about key slots. So here's the interface to inline encryption that we present to file systems. A file system only needs to do the following three things. First thing it needs to do is for each bio it submits that it wants to use inline encryption for, it should set up a biocrypt CTX for the bio by calling biocrypt set context uh, on the bio with the key, the algorithm, and all the other things it wants, it needs to actually do encryption. And this function will allocate memory for a biocrypt context using a mempool and associate it with the bio. The second thing it needs to do is, at some point not from the data path, before a bio is constructed from the pages of an inode and submitted, the file system should call block crypto start using mode on the algorithm and the request queue where algorithm is the crypto algorithm that the inode is, is going to be encrypted with, and the request queue is the request queue that the bio will be submitted to. So this function will set up the kernel crypto API fallback if it might ultimately become necessary, if the request queue doesn't actually support the algorithm. And the last thing it needs to do is tear down the biocrypt context for a bio after the bio is ended by calling biocrypt free context on the bio. Now here's what storage drivers on the, on the other end of the uh, chain need to do to make use of our design of inline encryption. Firstly, they'll need to set up a key slot manager in their device's request queue by calling key slot manager create with the number of key slots that the hardware supports uh, and a bunch of function pointers that let the key slot manager actually program you know, encryption context into any arbitrary key slot in the hardware. Also, a way to evict slots and find program encryption context and so on, and also a pointer to any arbitrary private data that the driver wants. Then whenever they process a request, they can retrieve the key slot that block crypto program the bio encryption context into by calling biocrypt get key slot on the first bio in the request. Alternatively, they can set up a pass-through key slot manager and whenever they process a request, they can directly retrieve the encryption context of a bio from its struct biocrypt CTX. All right, so as part of the patch series and as proof of concept of the rest of the design, we add support for inline encryption to the UFS storage driver. And we follow the UFS HCD v2.1 spec, which uh, introduced inline encryption to UFS. So the UFS driver in Linux is organized as follows. Uh, there is a base UFS code that contains a lot of the common functionality. And there are vendor specific drivers that call into the base code and we added the inline encryption support following the aforementioned UFS HCD specification to the base code itself. We also introduce what we call the crypto variant operations, which are essentially functions that a vendor specific driver can register ahead of time with the base code that the base code will call instead of the implementation that follows the specification that we added. So vendors can easily override or extend how their hardware is manipulated if their hardware has some quirks. Now we also add support for our design of inline encryption to FS script and to F2FS so that we have a complete stack that is inline encryption capable. Uh, we add a new policy to FS script that defines a new on-disk format. Uh, 
to optimize uh, the way inline encryption works and how keys are managed with it. And we also throw in some changes. We also throw in the changes to the DM layer that let them use inline encryption as uh, context for the pass-through key slot manager. Let's on to testing and status of our partners with respect to our approach. So we have uh, Qualcomm and MediaTek who are on board with our approach. Uh, variant, variant operations have been useful to deal with, uh, have been very useful, especially where the UFS crypto specifications uh, have been incomplete especially with regards to power management. Uh, both of these partners are currently testing our patches, and we've also been testing the patches using XFS tests by running all inline encryption through the kernel crypto API fallback. Uh, they've also been tested by backporting them to the Pixel 3 and using the inline encryption hardware that the UFS card on the device has. So future work. Uh, we still need to add support to EMMC and other storage drivers. Uh, we'd also like to add support to other file systems like ext4. And uh, thank you. Uh, any questions or comments? Yes. Thank you. Is there uh, a way to use your, um, you had some sort of, back a few slides, you had a, there, uh, the quirk, hardware quirks to disable entire support for encryption if such uh, devices still exist, which they probably do? Uh, right, I mean, it's certainly possible to do it. I mean, you can pretty much uh, say when you're trying to, one of the things that the crypto variant operations does let you override is during the setup of the uh, entire structures of the thing. So you can at least, you know, just say you don't support it at all. But other than more to the point of actually uh, testing whether or not, uh, you know, the hardware is actually doing the encryption, uh, you can directly test that in, with this framework because you, know, you can just write something with a particular key and then read it back without just read it back without decrypting it and decrypt it in software or something to test whether it's doing the encryption as you expect it to. So on format, could we add a test to do that? Sir, on what? On format or on the first write to the disk, would it be viable to do something like that so it's tested at, at runtime? Um, yes, uh, so one thing we were considering is adding some sort of self-test module somewhere to actually do that. Okay. I think that's also, I guess, future work. Okay, so the user interface to this uh, is essentially just the uh, single policy flag that we've added to FS script. Um, so if a user, sorry, so if user space wants to make, you know, write a file and you make use of an encryption, they will simply need to uh, create the file and set an FS script policy with the flag that says, you know, use inline encryption. Um. Two questions. First yeah. one is uh, roughly how many key slots do the, does this hardware typically support? Um, so about 32. Okay, interesting. Yeah. All right, for the other question. I mean, uh, it, does, it does vary quite a bit. Some, sure. there, there exists some that have a single key slot. It's a bit weird, uh, but I think in general 32 is normal. Okay, yeah. what about um, cipher modes? What, what do, do, does this hardware typically support saying cipher modes? Like is it easy enough to have a software fallback that that can you know result in the same file that you would if if you're not using inline encryption. Right. So currently, I mean, things support things like AASXTS, okay. which is you know, also supported by our kernel crypto API. Right. Um, they have ASCBC, I believe. Uh, you know, it, it of course varies. So pretty common. So yes. so if you're on a system that does support inline encryption and you you know you use that for a couple of years. Can you move those files reliably to another system that maybe doesn't have the same inline encryption support and, right. and so, still so use those? The, the idea is yes, uh, you, should, you should be able to do it because we have that kernel crypto fallback in place. Yeah. Which, yeah. Nice. Yeah, I mean, in theory, one could imagine some interface where you could force the use of the software crypto as opposed to the inline crypto yeah. just to verify the hardware. Whether or not that's something that you do at development time or 
you know, on runtime, on yeah, on runtime on every single boot is I think a different question, yeah. and I don't know that an interface has been defined to make that easy. And right, I understand you did that for testing yeah. purposes, but. Um, apologies if I'm not fully understanding it, but you mentioned much earlier um, the request queue and the extent to which, like, you know, having one block uh, encrypted in one context versus another, you know, affects, like, request merging and stuff. Did, what changes if were necessary for the request layer, or maybe that's just completely transparent to it, and, like, uh, what are the performance consequences for... Um, so the changes to the request layer is uh, it now needs to check whether they're both the same context, and if not, don't merge it, right? That, okay. That's the part, yeah. Yeah, I think the bigger deal was the increase in, in the size of the struct bio and getting Jens to sign off on the right. acceptability of the same. Right. Does this have any um, restriction on block size, right? Uh, reads, I guess, as well. As in restriction, that's the that restriction. Uh, uh, well, so do, you, do you require 4K block size for no. this? Um, so it's not a requirement. Uh, inline encryption doesn't you know, mandate that you use 4K block sizes. Uh, certain file systems do. So F2FS, I think, uses 4K block sizes. So that's what you have to use for F2FS. But uh, otherwise, there is no inherent uh, restriction on block sizes. I think the current FScript helper layer has a restriction that block size and page size have to be the same. Uh, there is a developer from IBM which has patches to relax that. Um, and it actually has nothing to do with inline crypto. It's just he was interested in being able to support 4K file systems with FS script on power. Um, so those patches exist. They haven't been merged yet. And that's largely Eric and my fault because we've been too busy with other things like that. <laughs> So you, you compared it a little bit to SED and Opal uh, disks. Have you, do you have any idea early on for performance comparisons to those? Do you, are you able to reach similar performance numbers? I mean, uh, so I haven't done any like, performance tests sure. against SED, but uh, again, I think these two things try to solve different needs, right? Like Definitely. SED yeah. is mostly about full disk encryption, and Linux hardware is really trying to optimize FPE. So. And I'm not sure if there is really comparable hardware. Yeah. That, yeah I mean, mo mostly in the encryption currently exists on S, like uh, phone SOCs. Right. So yeah. You're not. Yeah. yeah that, it's that it's that a bit hard sense. to really compare. Yeah. Other questions? So when you do in crypto, you normally like chaining um, some aspect of the I/O blocks together, so you don't have like a dictionary uh, attack on Sorry, them. Sorry, chaining what? Um, so you normally got like a, a counter through from one block to the next. Uh -huh. Is that still the case? Sorry, I don't think I understand. Uh, the uh, I mean, sorry, is the um, crypto key kind of seeded with a, um, a block counter? Or, 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 or chaining. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, uh, you're asking about crypto. Uh, are you doing like cipher block chaining between, you know, one IO block and the next? Or a counter mode? Uh, it's about 6TS. Yeah, it's about 6TS, yes. So. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so the reliability entire file is, um, you know, inherently on the block before it. And can you support seek modes? Can you support? Can you seek to, you know, a position in the file without oh. actually reading the entire file up until that point uh -huh. and still decrypt it? Yeah, I think so, yes. I, I don't see why. Yeah, you're, you're basically asking, uh, I, I think the question you're asking has to do with the initialization vector, um, and there is an initialization vector that is calculated for each block. Okay. So it's not, a, it's not a stream cipher. Right, right. So I guess this work is based on uh, block MQ? Yeah. 
Uh, yes, I believe it is. So is it like a very bad sterilization point? Sorry, is it what? Uh, is it a sterilization a point? Uh, is like, is it going through the same, I don't know, uh, lock? Because it, it, uh, will, it will just kill the purpose of block MQ. Uh, okay, so, so when I say it's based off block MQ, uh, it's uh, actually, it, it, it's a block, the, the crypto stuff that the, the, the block crypto does is happens before it even goes into the make request function of a request queue. So it's yeah, not I mean, really. Uh, to have all the performance of block MQ, you should not have like any common locks. So if you add something to block MQ, because you add something to block MQ, you need to build it in such a way so it does not use basically uh, shared locks. Yeah, different layer. I mean, the, hard, the encryption is actually being done by the hardware, so we're just simply passing the information along to the hardware. Yes, and that's actually happening in the file system uh, with like read page or write page, which is already a serialization point, right, on a per inode basis. If you have multiple pro processes using multiple uh, writes to uh, different files, those will be handled uh, in parallel. Um, but both ext4 and f2fs uh, serialize uh, files, reads, and writes anyway. So that's, yeah. <laughs> the encryption layer is actually being done in hardware, right? So the only thing the file system needs okay. to do, right, is number one, trans translate logical block to physical block, and that's serialized already. And we also pass along what encryption key to be used, right? So there are file systems that actually will do parallelized reads and writes like XFS. Um, we're not targeting those file systems. XFS is not used on uh, these sorts of devices that we're initially targeting. Uh, so you can, it's just something has to decide what key to use, right? And uh, right now, all the interfaces are actually designed for file systems. So. <clears throat> Sorry, maybe this is an obvious one. Where are the keys stored? Is, is, like, the, where do you initially get them on uh, boot? On, okay, so, uh, so inline encryption doesn't actually change where the keys are, you know, where you get the keys and everything from. Uh, FS script pretty much, you know, works as is, uh, I mean, as it used to. Uh, it stores, it maintains track of which files have what keys and so on. Um, but uh, for a more uh, detailed explanation of how the user's key goes into, right, okay, so at least on Android, uh, what we do is uh, when the user is created, we generate keys for a user that's going to be there, that's going to be essentially the key that we use to encrypt data for a particular user. Um, what if a script does is uh, that key will, you, you run some sort of key derivation function on that key and come up with a profile key and that's the key that's going to be used eventually by FS script to encrypt and decrypt a particular file's data. And the user's key comes in uh, uh, earlier on in the process where uh, the user's key is used to uh, decrypt the actual key that we're going to use for the uh, file data encryption and decryption. Okay, and so if, if, you, if you break that key, basically the, you can't get your data back, is that the idea? Uh, in, yes, that, that's the idea. Without yeah. that, user's password, you shouldn't be able to read uh, right. data encrypted with, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Other questions? All right. All right. Thanks, Satya. Thank you.